Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth webinar in our fiscal year 2019 webinar series titled Getting Started Completing SOAR Assisted SSI SSDI Applications. My name is Pam Hine, Senior Project Associate with the SOAR TA Center, and I will be your moderator today. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items um, to start. As a disclaimer, this training is supported by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The contents of this presentation do not necessarily reflect the views or policies of SAMHSA or DHHS. The training should not be considered substitutes for individualized care and treatment decisions. Just a few webinar instructions. As a reminder, your lines will be muted throughout this entire webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for download on the SOAR website in about a week. You may now download the presentation slides a few ways and other materials now by going to the top left of your screen and clicking File, Save, then Document, or visit the SOAR website at soarworks.prainc.com, click Webinars on the left sidebar, and choose today's topic. At the conclusion of the webinar, you will, be immediate, you will immediately see a brief evaluation, which we kindly ask you to complete. And finally, we will save all questions and comments until the end of the presentation, at which time we'll review instructions for posing questions to panelists via the Q&A function. To go over the purposes, uh, the purpose and objectives today, we hope that by the end of this webinar, you'll learn how to access and utilize SAMHSA SOAR tools and worksheets that can really help you in your SSI, SSD application process. And also learn why it's important to create and implement an agreed upon SOAR process between your SSA and DDS office, offices. We also want to show you how to apply best practices which will be shared by the SOAR TA Center and SOAR providers on getting started with completing successful SOAR-assisted SSI, SSDI applications. So to review our agenda, you will, you'll first hear from Wayne Young who is, and Kim Fiore, who are local leads in Nevada with WellCare Services. Next, you'll hear from Suzanne Straub, who is a SOAR coordinator and SOAR local lead at Community Services Northwest in Vancouver, Washington. And to round things up, you'll hear from Katie Lundy, who is a SOAR benefit specialist in Abington, Pennsylvania, to talk about how she got started doing SOAR applications. And then we will have plenty of time for Q&A. So providing today's welcome, we have Mark Jacobson, Public Health Analyst with SAMHSA. Mark? Uh, thank you, Pam. A warm welcome to all of you joining us today. On behalf of SAMHSA and the Homeless Programs Branch of the Center for Mental Health Services, I would like to welcome you to this SOAR webinar called Getting Started, Getting, Completing SOAR-Assisted SSI, SSDI Applications. SOAR helps states and communities increase access to Social Security disability benefits for eligible adults and now children and youth who are experiencing or at risk of homelessness and have a serious mental illness medical impairment, and or a co-occurring substance use disorder. Today's webinar will focus on the steps to follow with completing SSI and SSDI applications using the SOAR model after you successfully completed training through the SOAR online course. This webinar will give you many practical and proven ideas to help you get started on completing successful SOAR-assisted SSI, SSDI applications. I would also like to welcome our presenters and Thank them for their willingness to share your expertise with us. I'll turn this back over to Pam, who's going to be moderating our webinar today. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mark. So to give um, you an idea of what the SOAR leadership structure looks like and who will be your presenters today, this um, slide uh, will, you know, really let you know about how SOAR is structured in your state and national level and also at the local level too. So beginning on the far left hand side, you have the SOAR TA Center where I am from. And here at the SOAR TA Center, we help states plan and facilitate their SOAR initiatives. We also conduct leadership academies where state and local leads learn how to implement SOAR in their communities. Like today, we, we moderate 
webinars and we uh, do a variety of learning communities and we develop a lot of resources that will really help you get to where you need to go in filing SOAR applications. Uh, we uh, administer the SOAR Works website in, and also the SOAR online course and also OAT, our online application tracking uh, system uh, so caseworkers can track their cases. Uh, also, states have state leads and may again provide the coordination at the state level. Uh, they direct SOAR programs statewide and also they serve as liaisons to their localities and they also maintain relationships with SSA and DDS and for the most part SOAR state leads are the coordinating entity to submit SOAR, uh, SOAR outcomes to the National uh, TA Center too. Next, we have local leads, and today you're going to hear from three local leads. Um, and again, they facilitate SOAR in their localities, their cities or counties. Um, they direct the local Im implementation plans of their programs. They also facilitate SOAR online cohorts, which again is the first step in becoming SOAR trained, um, and also providing follow-up technical assistance to case managers as needed, and, it, and they're really uh, the folks that really ensure the, that quality applications uh, are submitted uh, to their SSA offices too. And lastly but not least, we have SOAR case managers who are really the heroes in this process because they're the ones who are completing the high quality SSI and SSD applications using the techniques um, shared in the SOAR model. And they communicate a lot with their local SSA and their state DDS representatives too. And they are asked to track their outcomes as well. And you'll be hearing from Katie who will provide the perspective of the SOAR um, uh, practitioner. So without further ado, we're going to hand the mic over to Wayne Young and Kim Fiore from Las Vegas, Nevada, who will share their tips on how they uh, help SOAR trainees in their communities get started on completing successful applications. Wayne? Thank you, Pam. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here um, presenting today. I hope everyone's in great health and spirits. Um, please excuse my voice. I'm a little bit under the weather. Um, as mentioned, Kim and I are um, SOAR local leads for Southern Nevada, and it's made possible through WellCare Services where we both work. Um, to give you a little background, WellCare Services um, provides a unique one-stop shop model of wraparound services where consumers are able to obtain medical, psychiatric care, therapy, case management, um, basic skills training, psychosocial rehabilitation, housing, transportation, and comprehensive assistance with um, Social Security disability claims using the SOAR model, um, where we fall in. Um, WellCare uh, Services currently houses three SOAR local leads in Nevada, which include Kim and I down here in the south and Jason Thompson in the north. Um, WellCare also employs staff solely dedicated to the SOAR or dedicated to SOAR in the state of Nevada, which I can attest to being the success of our program. I strongly encourage any of you um, practicing SOAR to advocate within your own agencies um, for the ability to dedicate yourself to the SOAR program without having other responsibilities. Um, prior to my joining WellCare, the individuals carrying out the SOAR program were case managers that also had a caseload in addition to monitoring and, and um, utilizing the SOAR program. Looking back, it's very easy to see that the barriers that came with that had a negative impact on the success of the program. So again, I just encourage any of you who are practicing SOAR, if you have the ability to definitely um, speak within your own agencies to become a SOAR dedicated staff member. It makes um, the SOAR program a lot more successful for you as well. So um, in the state of Nevada, um, the Affordable Care Act has impacted us with the Medicaid expansion. Um, because of this, WellCare was able to establish our unique one-stop shop model, becoming providers to one of the managed care organizations. Um, through this relationship, we recognize the opportunity to gather critical information that's difficult to obtain through interviews with our population. Um, I'm talking about uh, medical providers. We found that it was possible to obtain a claims history 
which gave us the ability to obtain confirmed information of clinics, hospitals, providers that they used rather than relying on the actual claimant to provide the information. As most of you know, the population doesn't always remember or aren't aware, just a lot of um, bar different barriers for different reasons on being able to communicate what um, places that they've been. Um, so getting a claims history through the insurance was not only um, just a blessing, but it saved time. It was just, um, it, it lowered the amount of hours that we would be able to utilize on the SOAR process. Um, so, uh, I've lost my train of thought here. Um, Additionally, the getting the claims history from the insurance company, we're able to confirm the contact information to request the records, get the dates of service that was actually used, which helps with the application process as well when you're actually doing the application and the reason for which they were seen. Um, the concept of getting records from the insurance company also to get the claims history helped us here in Nevada try to realize and realize that there were other networks available, not just because we happen to be um, providers for the insurance company. Here in Southern Nevada, hospitality is a major source of employment. A lot of people um, before becoming homeless and, and stuff had worked, and we realized that a lot of our industry um, was through the hospitality, and we have a major network um, called the culinary insurance here, which a lot of people utilized. Through that, we were able to establish another relationship through that insurance company to try to get claims history that way. And again, it just makes it a lot easier to try to get the information because it's actual proven information that they've been to rather than trying to extract the information from the claimant, which a lot of times they don't remember or things get messed up, they don't know what years they went, et cetera. Um, so about our about our um, additional roles as local leads. Um, Kim and I have established relationships with more than just DDS and um, the Social Security Administration. We've become resources for workers um, with, with, the county, with the county and the state. Many of the workers at the state um, have caseloads and like what I was talking about earlier, have the inability to dedicate their majority of their time to the SOAR process. So they'll write a condensed version of an MSR to help support the claim. The, the claim. Um, Kim has provided training um, in this area with the state workers. The state workers have um, come to know us and they'll send us their condensed versions of their MSRs for us to edit and help look at um, and kind of give out some pointers. So definitely we have also um, helped with the county and the state on that, on that sense. Um, additionally, um, I've established a partnership with a representative payee. Um, I know most of you have completed your, your training and may or may not be practicing just yet, but one of the things that I came across was once you did the SOAR process and you find it works and then you got them their allowance, it kind of doesn't end there. Um, they still need to get put in pay status, depending on your state um, or how Social Security Administration works in your state, how long it can take from actually getting approved. There's an effectuation process, um, possibly, and then the actual getting put into pay status. Well, during that time, there's, there can be a transitional period that can be a little rough. And so a representative payee can really help transition that. And so we've established a partnership with a representative payee here that's recognized by the Social Security Administration. So it's not a private payee, it's an organizational representative payee, and they assist the individuals beyond the SOAR process. They are really um, imperative on the transition. The representative payee helps with the effectuation process, also called PERC, um, ensures a smooth transition from the time that they're awarded to the time that they actually get into pay status. Um, our department, because of that, has recognized more need, and we've since added programs to ensure that additional benefits like their SNAP benefits are continued to the maximum amount possible to keep, um, to transition them into Medicare, 
to make sure that their Medicare is um, uh, where it needs to be and with all the necessary subsidy programs if they are um, eligible for them. Um, so we've definitely established um, a process with Social Security and DDS here. Um, we have had to go to the Social Security Administration, do in-person applications kind of as a way to introduce ourselves. So for those of you who don't already have a process set up in your areas, um, I highly recommend starting out taking one of your clients down to the Social Security Administration, kind of introducing yourself to whoever you can there and start establishing those relationships. Um, hopefully you have a state liaison that can help with this as well, but if not, this is where you would be um, very effective in establishing that relationship. Um, I know every state, I don't want to really get into it too much because I know every state may be a little bit different as far as the DDS process and when it goes to DDS. Um, the way that we set up our processes here um, involve our case managers. And our case managers do the initial screening. We've set them up with tools that we've used um, and taken from the TA Center. So it's been um, a, an immense help. Um, they use those tools. We kind of guide our case managers on what we're looking for in utilizing those tools. Um, the case managers screen the individuals and then they fill out a referral. If the person seems like they would be a quality claim, that's when they fill out the final referral paperwork and send it to Kim and I. Um, Kim and um, a couple of our other staff members will start to prepare paperwork, which Kim will talk about. Um, we utilize the claims history that I spoke about earlier and why we get a claims history. Again, Kim will talk about that as well. We set the uh, protective filing date. And within 45 days of setting that protective filing date is when we set up our appointment with the applicant to complete the Title II or SSDI application. Um, we also complete the paper portion of the SSI application, which is called the 8000, and we will hand that in in person. But we meet with the pay, we meet with the claimant 45 days after establishing that protective filing date, so that when we complete the 8000, we can get it into the Social Security Administration within the 60 days of filing that protective filing date. Um, so that your protective filing date is not expired. Hopefully I didn't ramble too much and you kind of caught that. Um, if we need to, we will meet with the claimant a second time around if we're still not 100% positive that the claim is going to be a quality claim. Um, but if that doesn't happen, we complete the online application. We um, um, notify our contact over at Social Security telling them that we just completed the online application and set an appointment to come in and bring in the 8000, any other paperwork, the 1696, the 827, um, the 3288. And now Social Security has implemented a new ID verification process, which a lot of our population are unable to do over the internet. So we have established also just bringing them in into the Social Security Administration, which I think I'm stepping on Kim's toes a little bit that she'll go over that as well. Um, so on that note, um, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Kim. <clears throat> thank you, Wayne. Hello, everybody. I'm glad to be here and um, thank you for having me present. Um, I'm jumping back um, off of the topic of how to, um, the process we go through just real quick to discuss um, the organization of the files that you create when you do a SOAR application. Um, I'm just going to share with you all um, the way we organize our files here uh, in Nevada uh, at WellCare. Uh, basically, if you imagine a file folder opened up, 
um, you have a left side and right side, usually there's prongs that you can um, hole punch and put paperwork in. On the left side, um, bottom left side, uh, bottom, we put the referral forms or the assessment forms, um, any intake forms. And once you set a protective filing date, you get a re-entry number that you should um, print out and have because if you lose that re-entry number, you won't be able to get back in to complete the application. So it's really important to save that. So we put that in that portion of the file as well. So everything on the initial um, processing of an applicant, we put on that bottom left side. We create a section, we have um, dividers. So in the middle section on that left side, <clears throat> we put their uh, copies of their ID, their social security card, and any other identifying documents they may have. It could be their insurance card, it could be their food stamp card, um, whatever copies we can get, we put in that section. But most importantly is to have a copy of their ID, have a copy of their social security card, um, if they have it available. Uh, the other thing we put in that middle section is the once we do the application um, with the client, we put in their um, SSDI confirmation information. Uh, so we print out the summary, we print out the um, confirmation number that it was submitted, we put that in the middle section along with a copy of their um, 8,000 and their copy of their 16. Uh, we put those in that middle, middle section. Then on the top part of that, we, um, our Nevada DDS has created a SOAR referral form that they like us to send to them. So that form contains the client's name, social security number, date of birth, um, important information that they need to know. We send that. DDS also wants us to send it with a copy of the 1696, the 827, and the 3288. So we put that together and we send that to DDS so that that's how they flag um, the claims they get in as SOAR claims. So we put that on the top left side. If your DDS doesn't have <clears throat> a referral form like that, you can use the SOAR checklist that you can find in the documents that in the SOAR website. But the SOAR checklist, the only thing missing from it that I would suggest you might want to handwrite on it if you use that form would be the client's date of birth. And the reason why we want that to be on the top left side is so that when you open the folder, immediately at a glance, you can have access easily to the client's name, date of birth, and social security number. So you don't have to dig through to find a form with each bit of data. You can have it there at a glance on that left side. On the right side of the folder, um, on the bottom part of the right side uh, in that section, we put the DDS documents. So uh, that would be the 3373, the adult function uh, report, the 3369, which is the work history report, any other documents that DDS requires, such as the headache form, the seizure form, drug and alcohol questionnaire, whatever applies. That's also the section where we put a copy of our assigned MSR um, in that section. The middle section, we put um, our medical ROIs, requests of information sheets, uh, with the fax confirmation sheet that it was sent. So when we go to send medical records, which I'll touch on here in a couple slides, um, we fax those medical records to the providers. Uh, we get the fax confirmation sheet. We attach it to the original ROI and we put it in the file. Um, we put it in the middle section because it makes it easy to access. And um, sometimes you'll find that maybe your fax didn't go through or maybe it did and the provider lost the file when you check up to see whether, uh, where the medical records are. So oftentimes they ask you to resend it, and it's easy if it's in that section to just grab and um, use again to resend for another request for medical records. Finally, um, on that right side top section, we put any SSA correspondence. That could be letters of approval or letters of denial, um, any kind of notices they send. Those generally go on that top right side. So once you get a decision, 
um, once we get a decision, that's where we put those notices um, on that side. So they're easy to refer to. Uh, the only other thing different that we do is on the left side, uh, going back to the left side, once the claim is done, let's say you've got an approval, once that claim is done um, and uh, if your organization or your agency is working with a representative payee, as Wayne mentioned, then the payee paperwork uh, we put on that top left side um, so that it's easy to access and easy to see once the, the claim is, is done. Okay. Um, <coughs> so, uh, Wayne touched on this earlier. We have case managers that screen um, each potential applicant for the SOAR process. Um, sometimes it's unclear when you're interviewing that person whether or not they have a pending claim already or not, or whether they've applied before in the past or not. Um, especially people with mental behavioral health issues, they tend to have very poor memories. Oh, did, is the slide? Oh. Kim, we are uploading a different slide deck. We'll get to where you were in just one second. Okay. It's not on your end. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, okay. There you go. Okay, so, <clears throat> thank you. So, um, in order to check, um, you do you would want to get a signed 3288 um, from from the client, um, and you can submit that to your local SSA office, and they can tell you if the person's currently pending a claim or not, if they've um, filed before or not. Um, you know that's information that you would need to know because if they already have a uh, claim pending. It's helpful to know if they already have legal assistance on the claim or not. Um, it's helpful to know what stage their claim's at, whether they're on an initial claim or at reconsideration or even possibly at the uh, law judge stage. So that's helpful information to get. Um, all right, so setting the protective filing date. Um, Social Security now requires that you um, uh, set up a MySSA account for the person in order to do the disability um, application online. With m almost everyone in our population, um, that's presented a barrier. Um, many of the people we work with um, here have mental behavioral health issues, so they're unable to remember, or well, even if they don't, they're unable to remember many of the questions that are required to set up a MySSA account. They have to remember the address that Social Security has on file for them. There's a lot of different questions that are very particular to their past of where they've lived, what financial institutions they've done business with. It's just really difficult to get a MySSA account established for almost every, everybody that you assist. So there is a workaround <clears throat> in doing it. So what you want to do is um, when you're setting up your protective filing date, um, you want to uh, click on start a new application, answer some of the preliminary identifications. Um, okay, if the applicant is, wait, this isn't, this isn't quite accurate. Um, the new new way workaround is actually you don't want to click it as I am applying for myself because um, that's kind of an old older slide. The actual thing is you want to apply as a third party. You want to say that you're applying for somebody and they're not with you, um, and that um, they're unable to sign. So once you do that, and you don't necessarily have to have the applicant with you to do that, you can create, do it third party. It'll take you through the rest of the questions. You answer the rest of the questions. So you'll have to have that data ahead of time if the applicant's not with you. And then um, you're going to, um, uh, at the end, when it gives you the reentry number, um, you want to stop. Don't go any further unless the client's with you and you're ready to submit the entire application. 
stop at the reentry number, print it out so that you have a record of what it is so you can go back in when you're ready, and then um, um, and then uh, save save that number. Yeah, go ahead. If I can just jump in and clarify something really quick. This is what I was, and I apologize, this is Wayne Young again. Um, I had spoken earlier of setting the protective filing date and then meeting with the client within 45 days to complete the rest of the application. This is where this comes in. The reason why we're setting the protective filing date is so that we can go ahead and start on the claim to get them the maximum amount of benefit as possible. However, we do need to make sure that we are able to see them within the 45 days to complete the rest of the application and complete the paper portion of the SSI application because we only have 60 days from this point to turn that SSI application into Social Security. So we do that in addition to taking the claimant to the Social Security Administration in order to do the ID verification. And the, way, the reason why we do it this way is because that setting up my SSA.gov account has been an incredible barrier where the person is unable to identify themselves using those preliminary identification questions. So we do the protective filing date setup under third party with them not being with us, or even if they were with us, we still have to supply a wet signature and even after we do that, our Social Security Administration here in Nevada has um, asked us for face-to-face -face contact so that they can do an identification confirmation. So this is why we do it this way here. Yeah, and so as this slide, I, I guess I got ahead of myself. This slide is talking about that process of setting it third party. Um, but either way, whether you are able to set a MySSA account to set the protective filing date or not, either way, you do want to stop at the reentry number, again, unless you're ready to proceed and complete the entire application. Okay, and that's just emphasizing that. All right, collecting medical records. Um, as Wayne stated earlier, we have the ability to get the claims history from the insurance company so we oftentimes are able to get a list of the providers that have seen the client. Um, so uh, when, prior, when we set the protective filing date, we set an appointment to meet with the client to get all the paperwork set. In that time period between setting the protective filing date and actually meeting with the client, we prepare all the needed paperwork. We prepare the 1696s, the 827s, the 3288s, then we prepare the medical um, requests of information, the ROIs. Um, we also uh, print out um, copies of the signature pages of the 8000 and the six, SSA 16 as well. Um, we'll uh, do the 3358 SSDI application only if we're not able to um, set anything online. So. Uh, we get the paperwork prepared for everybody, and then um, when the client comes to the appointment, we discuss the disability, we explain the disability process with them, and we explain each form and have them sign. We get multiple copies of each, and I would stress that you do this, get multiple copies of each document. Um, sometimes Social Security misplaces documents, sometimes they get lost. If you're mailing, they'll get lost in the mail, or if you're faxing, they don't go through. So it's always a good idea to have multiple copies. For our processes, we um, make all four copies of the 1696. We do about four or five copies of the 827, and we do at least three copies of the 3288. The medical ROIs, we just do the one copy because we, we don't actually mail out the ROIs. We'll uh, fax them, so we always have the original with us. Um, so, at, when we meet with them, we get everything signed. Um, at that same meeting, as Wayne said, we go ahead and complete the online application, um, and we also complete the 8000 and the SSA 16, which our local um, Social Security office is asked for. So we make sure we get all those completed. 
um, the medical records requests are sent out right away. So immediately upon getting them signed, that same day or the next day, we send the medical records out immediately. That's to give us as much time um, as possible to get the medical records in um, to our office uh, as possible. So that's kind of the time frame of when we send out for the medical records. Um, one of the things uh, that Wayne will talk about here in a little bit is about the building relationships with medical records departments and having a, a list um, of those providers uh, handy in order uh, to make it easier to know where to send those um, medical requests to. If I may interject one thing here as well, so that um, everybody doesn't get confused at how we're able to complete the online portion of the disability application, complete the, uh, the SSI application, complete um, all the paperwork that needs to be completed in this one sec, this one meeting with the, um, the claimant. Well, this is where I talked about where it's very advantageous to your staff members or you um, have multiple people utilizing the SOAR process and dedicated to the SOAR program. Kim and I meet with the claimant at the same time during this meeting. While she's completing the 8,000 application, I'm completing the online portion of the application. Some of the information is duplicated, so it's very easy to get the information at one time. When you are one case manager working on the claim, you will find that you might have to do multiple meetings with the person in order to get all this information. We try to do it all at one time. It's about a two to three hour meeting with the claimant just to get this portion done. But what we've re realized and recognized is that by doing it this way, we eliminate um, hours on their end, even though it's a little bit harder on us, but it works because sometimes our population disappears and we only get one chance with them. We won't have the ability to find them when we need them. So while we have them, this is how we constructed our process as far as getting all the information and getting all the signatures that we needed all at one time. And that's also why Kim was talking about getting multiple signatures, because in case they need a wet signature and it gets lost, we're being proactive in get, having another signature already there, so we're not having to chase them down and finding where they're living at the moment in order to just get that signature. Um, so, yeah, so I was going to um, just mention real briefly um, our process on that, that meeting. Uh, we do meet with them together as a team. While Wayne does the online application, I do the 8,000, but I also do the 16. You'll notice that in the 16, there's questions about work history. I also, at that time, take advantage of having the client there. I'll do the 3369 um, that DDS requires at that time to get their work history information. So that is helpful for Wayne because on the online application, there is a portion where he needs information about work history. So I'll have that handy because I would have already done it with the client and get the information for the 3369. I also, if there's time available, because the online application generally, once you get used to the 8,000, it doesn't take as long. The 16 is also a relatively short form. So at that time, I will get the interview the client and um, complete the 3373, which is the other DDS um, common um, pay, uh, form that is required, the adult function history. And at that time, a lot of the questions will provide you with information, really good information for your MSR, because it's all about functionality and the person's functional abilities. And you get a chance to talk with the client and get to know them better while you're doing the 73. I know that uh, many SOAR practitioners just give the client the 69 and 73 to complete on their own and figure, well, I don't have time to complete it. But you'd be amazed at how much time you save. If you go ahead and just have those as a fillable form, if you're good at typing, just typing in the client's answers. You can also guide them and explain some of the questions because clients on their own sometimes have difficulty understanding what DDS is asking them in, in the documents. 
So by helping them complete the forms, you're not only getting a good indication of their work history, but you're getting a good feel for that individual, their ability or inability to function, which in the long run will help you when you're crafting your MSRs. Um, so uh, I, I personally recommend doing it because it not only guarantees that DDS gets those documents that are needed to make the decision, but it also will, I think, help you as a case manager in the long run if you, if you do those documents. Speaking of the MSR, um, the MSR is, of course, the key, key thing that we do under SOAR. And so again, um, if you're going to interview the client anyway to find out more about their ability or inability to function, you're going to be asking them uh, a lot of the questions that are on that 3373. So it might serve you to go ahead and help them complete it you're going to put in the information as they state what their problems and barriers are, and you can use that information as well in that MSR. So I do kind of a mini MSR interview when we're meeting with the client um, to do their application. Uh, I'll turn it over to Wayne to talk about the provider list. So one of the things that we've also developed here to help out our um, practitioners here in Southern Nevada is we have a small network of hospitals, common clinics that um, people use, especially though prior to the Affordable Care Act when there wasn't insurance available, they would automatically hit up certain hospitals because they would be able to be seen without insurance. So we've um, put together a list of common providers, hospitals, um, stuff that's not so specific to the insurance company that we use because obviously other practitioners may not have the ability or the people that they're serving may not be utilizing the same providers. So we just came up with a list of common, which was still quite, quite a lot. It was maybe 35, 40 providers still, even without utilizing the specific uh, providers through the insurance. So this would include the hospitals, detention centers, jails, and what we learned even with the jail system is whether it's city, county, state, um, there were different fax numbers to send it to, there was different people, medical records departments to send it to. So through just doing it, we've kind of kept a good running list of people to contact, um, how they want it done so that we can get our medical rec records expedited, we happen to be in a clinic, so we're able to get our records a little bit quicker um, for those practitioners who are case managers for agencies that are not um, in a clinic who are unable to request those records as a continuity of care, but rather as for a disability claim. Um, there can be different processes. Um, a couple of our hospitals here don't recognize or don't allow um, requests for medical records through fax unless they are another clinic. So if they are requesting those records specifically for disability claim, they must mail it in. And those are one of the reasons, again, why you want to have multiple copies of certain forms, because if you have to mail the wet signature for each medical record with a hospital or a clinic, you obviously need another copy of the original. Um, some of the jails here re require a notary in addition to all the signatures that are needed. So we provided a list of all and any kind of barrier that you might possibly um, encounter while you're requesting medical records. And this is something that I would encourage if any of you are going to be local leads to start that process to help your practitioners in your area. Um, when we submit the SOAR application, um, again, we go to the Social Security Administration to do the ID verification. We drop off everything that's needed. They end up doing, the, the way that it works here is the Social Security Administration does the non-medical portion of the claim, making sure that they're eligible for benefits and whether they're citizen, married, um, if they've been married, if they've applied before, um, if there's an um, ALJ decision on the claim that's been recent. Once they confirm all that, they'll send it up to DDS 
in which um, Kim will have flagged DDS to expect the claim. And um, then we will have direct communication with the DDX examiner who is usually dedicated to SOAR as well. So the following slide shows all the, uh, um, the documents that, are, of course, are needed in order to complete the SOAR packet. We definitely use, utilize these lists and definitely have the forms um, through the TA Center. Um, one of the things also um, that I forgot about, when you're requesting medical records, sometimes if you're not, a, again, if you're not a clinic and don't have the ability to request records as a continuity of care, sometimes some of the hospitals and um, clinics will charge you for those medical records. In Nevada, we have a statute that says it's, um, that they're unable to charge for those medical records if you're helping someone apply for disability, specifically SSI. So I would encourage you to reach out to the TA Center to see if, those indiv if your individual state has those statutes as well. And that Thank concludes you. my portion. Thank you so much, and thanks for sharing your uh, teamwork in completing an application. And we'll take some questions at the end on um, initiating the application online and the MySSA account, and we'll we'll share some uh, thoughts on that as well. So next up, we have Suzanne Straub from Washington, who's going to share some uh, tips on how she helps her uh, trainees get started on completing applications. Suzanne. Thank you, Pam. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Suzanne Straub, and I work um, at Community Services Northwest as the SOAR coordinator. Um, Community Services Northwest is a mental health agency, but we also provide chemical dependency, um, housing, case management, outreach, and then, of course, we have our SOAR program. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about how our program got started, um, so I live in Vancouver, Washington. Um, we, we refer to our program as Clark County SOAR. Um, so a little bit of history on our um, SOAR program is that when I was hired back in 2011, I was actually hired as a PATH case manager. And for those of you that don't know what PATH is, it is um, Projects for Assistance and Trans Transition from Homelessness. And um, Part of the requirements for the PATH program is that um, PATH caseworkers are SOAR trained. So I attended um, an in-person two-day training uh, a couple months after I started. And the following Monday after the training, I, I completed three applications with individuals that I'd already been working with, um, just case management and, um, you know, access to other benefits and such. Um, in the, in the first year that I was a PATH case manager and SOAR trained, um, I was able to assist 26 individuals uh, through the SOAR model and obtained, helped those individuals obtain nearly $17,000 in back payments. And at the time, the, um, the amount for SSI was $698, so that was their average, um, that was their average monthly um, income that they, they started receiving. In 2012, um, uh, Clark County put out a, requ a request for application. Our, our county provides a lot of funding for our homeless programs, and so they saw what I was doing and thought that there was a need for um, some expansion on that. And um, our, my agency applied for community funds, and those community funds are available through document recording fees that homeowners pay um, when they are um, paying taxes and that kind of thing. Um, the funds were to be allocated to in, in innovative programs that would affect homeless, the homeless population, and obviously that's what SOAR's full focus is. So we applied for the funds, and the, we were awarded the funds, and that was a, able to fund a full-time SOAR coordinator position, and so that's where we got started, um, to, where I got started focusing on SOAR. Um, so some of the uh, strengths that we, we recognized were um, there was an increase in income, which led to stable housing. Um, we relieved local and state programs to, from supporting individuals. We have a couple of programs here in our community 
that um, provide um, housing assistance as well as just basic um, basic assistance on a monthly basis. And so when any individual receives those funds, they are required to actually pay those funds back if they are awarded Social Security. So that is, um, that's taking that burden off of our, our community and our state for the folks that actually get awarded Social Security. And also it provides a significant step in um, everybody's recovery. And currently our program has been funded continuously actually since 2012. Um, 2013, we reapplied for the funds. So we were, we were funded for a year, we reapplied, and we've been funded continuously since 2013 without having to reapply. So that's been really nice for us to, to know that we can continue going forward. Um, a couple of the things that my position has done in our community is just increase the community partnerships we have a really great collaboration with our local jail. We also have um, an amazing relationship with um, our local hospitals. We have two hospitals here in Vancouver, and um, one of them is a, a very huge source of referrals for, for our program um, because we do have an inpatient mental health unit there. And the social worker there um, often will call me and will, you know, uh, brainstorm on, on an individual. And then if she feels like they're a good candidate for, for SOAR, then she will send me over referral. And then what she will also do is um, send me their medical records with the referral so that I already have them, so I don't have to request them. And then, then we also have a really great relationship with our local Social Security office, as well as our Disability Determination Services. Um, I have a contact for each office, and anytime I have a question or need to problem solve something or ask a question about um, changes that have been made to forms or the online process or just anything that I need, I, I know that I can count on these two individuals to help me out. Um, one thing that, uh, that I did for our community that, that has been huge for the folks that I train is I created SOAR packets. So those packets are packets one through four, um, and I will show you in a couple of slides um, just kind of what that looks like. But the packets are basically broken down into um, packet one is um, everything that you need to do online with your client. Packet two is everything that you either need to drop off at Social Security or send in the mail. Packet three refers to everything related to working with the disability office and the adjudicator. And then packet four is just samples of um, uh, letters that you might need to send to Social Security or um, uh, a master list of our local phone list. So we, have, we also have a list of um, addresses, phone numbers, and um, fax numbers so that when we're filling out the disability report online, we can just refer to that and not have to click over to Google. Um, I also designed a hybrid SOAR training, so I take the, the online SOAR training um, provided by the SOAR TA Center, but I have made it a hybrid version and condensed it a little bit so that the folks that are in our community are um, learning how to actually do the SOAR process off of the packets that we've created so that they're working the SOAR model the way that our local Social Security office would appreciate us doing. So we start with the My Social Security account. Um, we do the, the SSDI application online. And then, um, then we move into the packet two, which is um, filling out the SSI application, the, disability, or the uh, representative forms, the function and the work history report, and then um, any, any other forms that we need to have signed that we weren't able to do online because maybe the person wasn't there or we just didn't get it finished in time. Um, and then I, every month I also distribute a monthly newsletter and uh, that mostly goes out into the community. Um, there are a couple of people on my mailing list that are across the state, um, but mostly within the community. And then I also, maintain our Clark County SOAR page, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. And then after our SOAR, our hybrid SOAR trainings, um, the, the folks that attend my trainings are asked to attend our bi-monthly SOAR collaboration meetings. So 
So we get together every other month. We always have a topic um, or sometimes we'll have a guest. Uh, last, the last meeting we had, we had our um, a representative from our Social Security office and he came in and did a Q&A with us and that was really helpful for a lot of our new advocates. Um, then this is just an example of what the monthly newsletter looks like. Um, I always like to include in any updates that Social Security puts out. So if there's going to be a benefit increase, I like everybody to know that. Um, if I had a collaboration meeting that month, then I will overview that collaboration meeting so that anybody that wasn't able to attend is able to see kind of what, what we talked about. Um, I always like to recognize um, anybody in the community that's involved with SOAR, whether it be Social Security, Disability, or just the SOAR advocates, and sometimes the TA Center gets recognized. Um, I like to recognize people that are doing a really great job because I think that it's important for people to, to acknowledge that other people are doing a good job as well. And then I also like to keep a running total of our numbers. Um, that way, everybody in the community can see where we're at as a community and what we've done to help people. And um, one of the, the key parts to that is a running total of the retroactive payments that our, um, that our clients have received. And you can't see it very well on that, on that picture, but I, I believe, if off the top of my head, we're, we're at almost $340,000 in back payments received since 2000. 12, I believe. And then um, on the uh, newsletter, I also like to make sure that everybody's aware of upcom upcoming training, um, the dates and the time location of the training, and our collaboration meetings as well. And then I also just like to include a mental health quote just to, just to throw in a little, little extra something. Um, this is just um, a view of our Clark County store website. So you can actually find this website through Community Services Northwest website. Um, so if you go to csnw.org slash store, it'll bring you right to this page. If you're somebody in the community and you're looking for other services, um, you would just go up to the services tab and drop down and it will sh show you all the services that we provide at Community Services Northwest. Um, so the way that we have this set up is this, is this is for the folks that have been trained. So when I do my trainings, they all are aware that if they need anything, that this is how they can get it. So if you were to click on packet one, then it would drop down and it would have a um, either a PDF or a Word version of all the forms that you need to complete packet one. So the, um, the SSDI application, the authorization to disclose information, the disability report, and then also a document that spells out that first, pro that first process step by step. So they have an idea um, exactly what they need to do. It's almost like a refresher for for them. And then the same thing with packet two, three, and four, that's just um, where they can go to access all the forms that they could possibly need for this entire process. Um, so basically just the website was designed to allow easy access to our packets for our advocates so that they, they don't have any trouble with it. I always encourage folks though to just pre-make their packets, um, so use this use this website to save all the forms and then make their packets ahead of time so that they have them, they can just grab and go. Um, um, our collaboration meetings, we have been doing our collaboration meetings from the very beginning and our meetings are really an opportunity for um, the SOAR advocates in our community to get together to learn a little bit about what, what's new, um, anything new that's changed with Social Security, um, so like when the My Social, Sec My Social Security thing came about, um, we did a, a topic about that. We walked through how you create that account with your clients and some problems that we'd been running into. And um, we will talk about um, our successes and some of our frustrations. And that's also my opportunity to learn what people might be struggling with, um, maybe with um, 
the, the paperwork itself or just the fact that, you know, oh, I had a really hard time getting a hold of somebody at Social Security. Um, and we just kind of problem solve that. And then what I do is I take those questions or concerns uh, to my contact at Social Security or if it happens to be a disability determination um, question, then I will take it to my contact there. Um, one very helpful thing that we have is that our local SSI facilitator from our Department of Social and Health Services attends our meetings. And he, um, so what he does is he helps through DSHS, he helps um, folks that come in applying for general assistance, he will help them apply for disability. Um, and it's actually a requirement for them, like I said before. So if they receive those funds, which in our, in our community, it's $197 a month um, cash assistance. So once they start receiving those funds, they're required to apply for disability to, to keep those funds. And then if they get awarded Social Security, they have to pay back that entire amount that they received um, with any back payment that they, that they get from Social Security. And then what Social Security will do is actually pay DSHS back before they give anything to the client. So the client really never sees that money and doesn't have to worry about, you know, writing a check or making a payment to DSHS. Um, and then again, our collaboration meetings are just an opportunity for our advocates to ask questions, problem solve, and share their successes. And our, I don't think that's my slide. No. Thank you so much, Suzanne. We oh. really appreciate you <laughs> sharing. Um, your leadership and some of the tools that you created. Um, we'll talk more about uh, them in the Q&A. Uh, thanks again. Now we're going to pass it along to Katie, um, SOAR practitioner from Abington, Pennsylvania, who's going to share some tips on how she got started. Katie? Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, so, um, sorry. Okay, so um, first I'm with the Visiting Nurse Association. So we're a nonprofit community organization. Um, our agency consists of home health aides, we have a children's clinic, um, and we also have a personal navigator program which um, encompasses our personal navigators who help clients c connected to public benefits like food stamps, cash assistance, um, and medical insurance. And then um, I have been fortunate to be lumped under that program as well with our SOAR program that we now have at our agency. So when we first got started, um, we were approached from a local housing uh, organization in our community who works with a lot of different housing resource centers. Um, they wanted to see if SOAR was a possibility. So we started that relationship kind of approached from another organization in our community. And then um, we wanted to figure out what kind of relationships we wanted to build with community partners to accept referrals. So we reached out to those um, housing resource centers. We specifically started with them when we first started. And since we've grown over the years, we now accept referrals from a lot of different places. So we get referrals from mental health providers, um, local hospitals, veterans offices, um, just a really wide range of different community partners at this point in time. So I think it's important to kind of figure out in the beginning who you want to accept referrals from, and then I think you want to work to develop a, an appropriate referral process. So for example, um, we have a referral form, and um, I apologize, I guess we, I don't have a handout for that, but um, in our referral form, we try and keep it as simple as possible so that the referral providers don't feel really overwhelmed with what kind of information we're looking for. So we just kind of work with getting some demographics about the client, um, listing any um, barriers that they may have. For example, we'll talk a little bit more about the MSR, um, but maybe different things that are limitations regarding their mental health status. So just kind of like little check boxes that people can, you know, kind of basically screen as they're doing their referral process to see if they're an appropriate referral for the SOAR program. Um, when we first started in our community as well, we set up a meeting with our local field office and we specifically met with the district manager as well as the assistant district manager. Um, we were really fortunate because our district manager had been familiar with SOAR from a previous office he was at. So um, in that regard, he was really excited when we, we approached the possibility of collaborating together so that we could work together in this relationship. Uh, 
Um, okay, I'm so sorry. So as far as like tips and tricks go, um, one thing you want to work on is find out what works for you and your local field office. So um, while we follow the guidelines that are with the SOAR model, we have to adapt to what our local office wants in order to make the SOAR process as streamlined as possible, which I know was touched on by some of the previous speakers as well. Um, I know our local office has specific forms they want us to use in addition to the ones that SOAR wants us to use as well. I also think it's important to utilize the resources available through the SOAR uh, TA Center. So one of the examples we'll talk about in the next slide is the MSR template. I think it's really helpful in guiding your writing style. Um, I initially used that to really get me started. I know it can be a really overwhelming process, and I think it's beneficial to uh, lean on the resources that are already available. Something else I think is really important, um, the electronic medical records became a really helpful tool for us. Um, when we first started submitting our uh, applications to the local office, we noticed that there tended to be a little bit of a lag time with getting all the records that we've turned in per part of the SOAR protocol to getting those up to uh, DDS to get them processed. So that was getting a bit of a lag time for us. So we worked and we enrolled with that electronic records express so that we could get that done. Um, Another thing I kind of want to touch on too is I know one thing that can be really scary and overwhelming is that relationship building with your local office. So when you set up to have your claim specialist, and I know that there were some different mentions about how people went about doing that, um, it's kind of like courting and dating, so to speak. And um, we went through the unfortunate process where we lost one of our, um, our claim specialists that we initially worked with. So that was really nerve wracking. Um, it basically felt like having a breakup with a boyfriend or a girlfriend, it was really overwhelming. Um, we had worked really hard to build that initial relationship and it was nothing due to our program. It was completely just to like staff turnover. So um, we went through that process, we got somebody new and in that process too, um, it ended up working out really well for us in the end. I think part of that is making sure that you really communicate well with the different people that you're working with. So, um, you know, I make sure to go down and, and have face-to-face -face interaction with her. Um, you know, we chat about, of course, our store clients, but we chat about other things too, just to kind of make it more of a personable relationship. And I think that's really important and imperative when you're working with different people. Um, I also think it's super helpful when you're working with people at DDS. Um, you know, you're talking to people over the phone that are, you know, very far away from where you're, you probably are located, so you're never actually seeing them in person. So I think just, you know, making conversation and getting to know them, you know, kind of like that um, I scratch your back, you scratch my back kind of a thing. And I think you'll find that you, you know, developing these relationships, especially when you're communicating so frequently, will come a little bit easier for you as well. Um, another thing I think is a great tip and trick is to rely on the TA Center. Um, when I first started with MSRs, I felt like they were really overwhelming. <laughs> um, there's a lot of information. You're doing a lot of screening when you're meeting with these clients. There's a lot going on with a lot of our clients, especially with the different mental health diagnoses they may have. So I think it's really good to lean on the TA Center. Um, you can send in your MSR. They are so more than happy to go over it. They'll review it with you. They'll give you some different tips and tricks, maybe certain things that you didn't realize DDS would be wanting to look for. Um, you know, it's that was super beneficial when I first started, and I still use it when I feel like I need to use it. Um, they're just a call away, and I think it's really important to remember that they've been there before. Um, they're really familiar with, you know, the clientele that we work with. They're not going to judge you. They're not going to judge your writing style. They're more than happy to help, and I, I think it's a, a very, very valuable resource to use. Another thing I think is important is self-care. Um, again, a lot of the population that we're working with has trauma in their past. Um, you know, there's a lot of information that's being shared, disclosed, and a lot of different experiences you'll see with your clients as well. Um, you know, and I, I think it's important that you recognize and that I know for myself that I recognize sometimes I need to decompress. So, um, you know, that may involve me checking in with a supervisor, you know, talking about a case that really hit, you know, hard to me. Um, you know, a lot of these situations are really sad and, um, you know, it's, it's hard not to take your work home with you. So I think it's important to, to really digress that and make sure that you're sharing that information in the best way that you can so that you're, you know, take care of yourself so that you can help the clients you want as well. Um, you know, and then practice makes perfect. Uh, you know, starting out in as a SOAR benefit specialist, you know, there's a lot of different forms, there's a lot of different numbers. You know, you got the 16, the 1696, um, 
827s, like there's so many numbers and everything just takes time to learn. Um, I've been blessed that I've been given the opportunity to this full time. So I have, you know, a lot of time and a lot of experience that I've gained under my belt, you know, doing this job, but especially for, you know, um, caseworkers that are, are doing other jobs and you're trying to fit in SOAR on top of it, you know, it's an overwhelming process. I think it's important to lean on other people um, and then also just, you know, practice the more you practice, the better you'll get. But again, lean on the TA center. They're, they're completely there to help you. Um, I also think when you, in regards to practice, um, one thing that can be really beneficial is reach out to other people in your community that do SOAR. Um, when we first started our program, we reached out to a really well-known organization, HAP in Philadelphia, to get trained with them as well. They're really familiar with the program. They do it all the time. They're extremely successful. So, you know, we leaned on other people and other supports so that we could have that, um, that extra knowledge. So, and they actually provided some of those kind of resources um, that Suzanne was talking about as well, like some handouts, things that really helped guide us in that process. Um, and again, to, you know, reach out to the TA Center if you have questions, email them, call them. Again, they're extremely happy to help you in any way that they can. So um, in regards to the MSR uh, interview guide and template, uh, this MSR interview guide, it's a template, um, it's really helpful in gathering detailed information and facilitating your writing style. So I'm going to show you what that looks like here. So this is a uh, interview guide and template. So this really breaks down the different steps um, in regard to what what you want to look for when you're kind of gathering the information to present an MSR for um, DDS. So it gives a lot of context. One thing I really like that it has, it has a lot of open-ended questions um, as suggestions to ask your clients. So that'll really help you gather background information on them, such as uh, education, history, assessing their family background, um, and including their work history as well, which is important. Um, you'll also notice that there are sections that um, you'll be writing about to showcase your client's functional limitations, um, which has information and suggestions on uh, different questions to ask your clients. And again, this is important as DDS will use this to better understand your client. Uh, these sections are really helpful because they actually help paint a really good visualization of who your client is. So the providers that are evaluating them at DDS can visualize who they are and understand how their symptoms really impact their ability to interact uh, you know, remember information, interact with others, concentrate, and even manage their daily activities, which again um, are categories of the MSR and function uh, limitations that DDS is really looking for when they're evaluating your clients. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is that I think it's really good to use this when you first start out because, again, the MSR can be very overwhelming. Your writing style, you're, you know, it's kind of like writing a college paper all over again. And, you know, you have to figure out what works for you and how your writing style kind of adapts. But you really want to showcase your client's limitations. Um, so you really want to highlight those negatives. Unfortunately, it's the best way to kind of explain it. But highlight the, you know, the negatives, like how your client is really being limited in their ability to, to function in society and to function in their um, potential to potentially work. So, um, you know, if you're, you're struggling to really showcase that and you feel like you're, you're not highlighting enough of the client's disability um, or you're feeling that there's some limitations and in, in feeling like it's a really strong MSR, reach out to the TA Center again. They will happily review that. They will give you tips and tricks. I know for myself, um, personally, we deal with a lot of clients that have mental illness. That's a really large component of our population. However, we do get clients from time to time that have um, physical diagnoses that maybe I haven't experienced with a previous client. So I want to show how that's limiting, um, you know, for that client as well. And so sometimes I'll write about it, and if I'm not 100% confident in that MSR, I'll reach out to the TA Center, and um, they're great with giving you some different tips and tricks like, you know, maybe use this, maybe don't use this, or, you know, one of those people may have also had experience with a particular diagnosis, so they can guide you in some different questions to maybe ask your client to see if you can add some more detail to the MSR so that you have a better writing style and have a better case to present. Because um, at the end of the day, you know, the, the providers and the doctors can read what your client looks like on those medical records, um, and you're, of course, you know, it's helpful to tie in direct quotes and bring things back from those medical records, um, but they, they want to see who this client is. They want to visualize that maybe your client is struggling to, um, you know, sit still in like a five-minute meeting. You know, they're, they're 
you, they can see that the client is, you know, antsy, they're uh, jumping up and down, they're, maybe they're pacing the room, maybe you even describe things like um, you're in a 10 by 10 room and, you know, the client can only sit for two minutes before they get agitated. Um, you know, you can tell that they're anxious, they get up, they have to leave, you know, it takes them 20 minutes before they come back. You just want to be really detailed in that too. Um, so again, I think it's really important to reach out to the TA center when you're, you're leaning on them as well, especially when you're starting out. Um, of course, it can be an overwhelming process, but just remember that everybody's been there at one point in time from the start and, um, you know, we're always happy to help. I know that, again, reach out to local people as well, whether it's your local lead um, or another provider in your community. Again, they've all been there, and I, I think everybody is more than willing and happy to help in any way that they can. Thank you so much, Katie, uh, and thanks for uh, talking about the TA Center and how they were able to help you at the very beginning of uh, submitting SOAR assisted application. So thank you so, so much for that. We do appreciate it. Um, a lot. So one of this slide really tells you some of the resources that are available, resources that um, Katie has utilized, and we want to make sure that you visit it, visit it often. Um, reach out to your SOAR TA Center liaison. You can find that on your state's homepage. If you don't know if you have a local lead, we can direct you to your local lead. Um, and again, all of the tools that our local leads share today are available on our SOAR website. And even um, Katie's referral tool that uh, she has adapted, we'll make sure you have her tool as well. And I know some of you have already asked a question about um, the way Kim and Wayne in Las Vegas organize their folders. And we can talk to them about sharing uh, maybe a one-pager on what theirs uh, looks like as well. And for some of the, our new SOAR practitioners out there and even folks that have been doing this for a while and you have questions, please join our Soaring Over Lunch call. If you don't already, here is some information on how to access uh, these calls that are monthly for an hour. And it's an opportunity to share some of your questions and have some of your colleagues uh, kind of provide some answers uh, for you as well. Um, and here again are some of our resources on our website and how to access uh, these resources as well. So again, we really want you to connect uh, to your to the TA Center, us, um, your state and local leads, and again, really identify your SSA and DDS contacts. Um, you heard throughout these presentations the importance of building those relationships with your local offices. And again, this is something that uh, if you're a case manager, your local leads can help with. And again, the TA Center can help you establish these great contacts. Because again, they do, we help them do their job in serving individuals who are homeless, and we, uh, they also help us do our jobs as well. So. Without further ado, we want you to, uh, we have some time left for Q&A. Um, so again, you can type your questions into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of the screen. We do have many questions that came in over the My SSA account, and we know that SSA is aware of this uh, barrier for some of the uh, individuals that we serve and have worked with uh, localities and us at the TA Center on developing workarounds so that this doesn't, um, really uh, prevent an application from uh, being submitted and moving forward. Um, so we'll be able to um, take some of those questions. Uh, one of the things that Wayne and Kim does in Las Vegas in helping individuals open an SSA account is bringing individuals to the SSA office. And I was going to ask Wayne uh, very briefly to talk about uh, that process of assisting applicants in opening up their My SSA accounts. So on the MySSA account, um, when you're going online to, uh, and Pam, please jump in if, if I'm not on track here, but when you go online to establish the protect a filing date, you're going to go to the SSA.gov account or website, go to filing um, an initial claim. It's going to ask questions or it's going to give you a prompt to do it as a first person or third person. If you're doing it as first person, you have to create a MySSA.gov account. In order to create a MySSA.gov account, you have preliminary questions that it will ask in order to identify yourself. I can vouch for even myself when I try to create my own SSA.gov account, I actually had barriers that I had to go and look up my own paperwork in order to find the answers. 
So needless to say, I think in our history since this has started, we've only had one person that has been able to successfully create a MySSA.gov mm -hmm. account. So if we're unable to do that, then we go to creating or initiating the online application as third party. Um, Kim mentioned that you put down that the person's not with you. I still put down that the person is with me, but it doesn't make a difference because um, Social Security will still ask for wet signature, and we still have to go to Social Security to um, prove their identification anyway. Can I jump in, Wayne, real quick? All right, that, that was the way the website used to be. They no longer have the option. Of, they used to have an option that said um, that you're a third party and the person's with you, but that's no longer there. Okay. Yeah, They'll, they only give you two options now. One is that the person is with you or that it's the person doing the account, actually. It's not even that they're with you. It's that the person themselves is doing the application. The only other option now is that you are not the person and that person is not with you or not able to sign this, the um, application. So those are the only two options that are in existence right now. I guess where that comes back to me is um, we set the protective filing date and then we continue 45 days later when we meet with the claimant to finish the application. <coughs> Excuse me, when I sign back in with the re-entry number to complete the application, it then asks me again whether or not I am the person, whether I'm third party, and whether the person is with me or not. That's where I'm saying it's not relevant whether the person is with you or not. You, either way you answer, you can still finish the application at that point because it's a third party application and we still have to take our person to the Social Security Administration to prove ID as well as turn in all the wet signatures. Okay. Well, if anyone is experiencing any barriers, please reach out to your uh, TA Center liaison and we can talk about this a little bit more, maybe clarify any issues because we know that if you're filing as a third party, um, that that application would be mailed to the applicant or you as the uh, SOAR case manager if your address is on file, um, you know, to have the applicant sign it. Um, so again, we'll, we can talk to you a little bit more about that if your question really hasn't been answered or you're still a little bit fuzzy about what to do in that situation. We've had a few questions come in about serving, uh, using the SOAR process for children, and this is a good opportunity to share that uh, SAMHSA has added to the SOAR curriculum um, for children. So you can access a separate online course for representing children uh, from zero to 17, um, and it is a separate course with separate uh, NASW CEUs, and uh, many of the tools that you see here today, we've adapted many for use for uh, children applications. So if you're curious about that, we really encourage you to check it out and, um, you know, we really encourage you to take the course. And again, if you have any questions about that, since it is new, please reach out to your uh, TA Center liaison and we can talk about any initiatives going on in your area. Um, one of the questions that we had is, um, the filing applications for individuals, using the SOAR process for individuals who are not homeless or at risk of homelessness. And we know that the SOAR process can be really used for anybody, uh, but in order for this to be a SOAR claim, when you file it with Social Security, you could only use SOAR if the individual is homeless or at risk of homelessness. And we do have as one of the tools, which will be uploaded to the website, is is um, the definition of homelessness. Uh, so we really encourage you to take a look at that. Um, and again, if you're not sure if this would be, if it's appropriate to use the SOAR process or submitting a case um, as SOAR, uh, please again reach out to your uh, TA Center liaison or your local lead in your area. Um, I would definitely encourage you to, to do that as well. Um, Again, we, we do have um, some questions that have come in about um, 
how to find out if you have an SSA contact. Um, how do you find that out? Um, and again, one of the things, if you're unsure, um, you again, reach out to the TA Center liaison. We can put you in contact with your local lead. Um, or if you don't have um, a sore process in your area, we can help you establish that contact um, so that they're aware that um, you, as a, uh, you've been, you've taken the SOAR training and you'd like to start submitting um, applications uh, using SOAR so we can help you with that. Um, so just uh, Suzanne, maybe this is good for Suzanne Straub, can you talk a little bit about how you've uh, been able to uh, develop a SSA contact at your local office? Yeah, so when I got started, um, I, didn't, I didn't really have anybody, but what ended up happening was um, I had submitted an application and the woman who was the representative taking care of what I had submitted um, ended up being my contact for a long time. Um, she just, I, I tried to explain to her what I was doing, that it was new in our community and um, she just kind of took on that role as our contact. And then she actually retired a couple years ago, so she did a really nice warm handoff with one of her coworkers who um, has been my contact for a couple years. And then in, in turn, I also got connected to his supervisor who was actually the one that came to our last meeting. So it's just kind of um, explaining to them what you're trying to do and asking if they have somebody that is, you know, willing to answer questions as you go along. Um, especially if it's new for you in your community, in your office, your local office. Um, yeah, that's kind of how it started for us. Yeah, and I know uh, similarly with Wayne and Kim in Las Vegas that their SSA contacts actually come, are able to come to your SOAR steering committee meetings where you can discuss um, issues and um, get some feedback and work on issues like um, my SSA accounts and um, things of that nature. Um, thanks. We have a, a couple of questions that came in along medical records, and I know one of the components of um, um, one of the critical components of SOAR is um, using SSA's electronic services wherever possible. And one is the electronic records express. So we had a couple questions come in about how to utilize ERE, electronic records express. Um, and I know both of you do utilize that, and I'm just going to throw it to everyone. If you want to talk about um, how you've been able to utilize ERE with submitting initial applications and getting your medical records. And again, this may be a little bit different state by state. State DDSs may have their own processes for how to enroll in that. But maybe Katie, if you use ERE, if you want to talk a little bit about that for our remaining uh, couple minutes. Sure. Um, so our local field office set us up with the information to get connected with that. Um, once you register, which is a pretty simple process, um, it's been a little while since I've done it, but um, I know that I've gotten locked out a couple times too, so I just call and, and get reestablished with them. Um, but basically what you do is when you send a um, an application off, as your um, representative for that client, when you fill out that 1696, You'll get a fax to you, um, or you should ideally, that's how it works for us. Um, you get a fax with like a cover sheet on it. And on that cover sheet, there's gonna be um, a bunch of different like special numbers and different codes at the bottom of it that allows you to send information back to um, to DDS regarding like medical records. Um, so that gets sent out to like all the different providers. So if you included different medical providers on that application, that 827 that um, serves as like a blanket release to request those records will go out. So what happens is we get that 827 back and we get this special fax cover sheet. So um, when we log in, we use those numbers to input, which basically gives a bunch of identification to verify who that client is beyond their social security number. And then all we do is we have scanned all the medical records in that we've requested um, and we upload them right up into the system. Similar if you're just 
um, attaching an email, um, a file to an email, you'll just, you know, hit browse your computer, you'll upload them, um, and then you'll send them in. One thing that we do note, though, is um, the way that we store our electronic or medical records on our computer system is we have a really secure data network. We never store anything like on a desktop, anything like that, um, for confidentiality reasons, obviously. Um, but it's a pretty simple process. And then they get up to DDS, at least from our experience, um, they're usually there within 48 hours, if not even sooner. Um, sometimes it just takes them a little bit of time to contact us, let us know that they got them. They're obviously very busy individuals up there. Um, but it makes things so much faster. I yeah. know that you know, some of the records we get, you know, can be hundreds of pages for one client. So for our local claim specialist to spend all that time, you know, throughout their job of, you know, regular things that they're doing in addition to SOAR, they can easily spend an hour just constantly feeding it into the fax machine where we can take the time to do that work and then, you know, we can get them up right away. So, yes, yeah, so um, thanks for asking about yeah. ERE. It's definitely efficient. Um, and if you want to learn more about it, email us. Uh, Get in touch with yes. us at the TA Center, um, and we can share more information about that. So it does look like we're out of time, and if we, if we didn't get to your question, we'll definitely get it answered, pose it to the appropriate presenters, and get an answer back to you, too. So we'd like to, for you to take a moment to complete the evaluation, which you'll see upon exiting the web, webinar. Um, and again, on behalf of the SOAR TA Center, we'd like to thank all of our presenters for their informative uh, discussions today. And again, our next webinar will be on the top of Outcomes Collection and OAT Online Application Tracking on June 6th, so look for registration details soon. And again, have a great rest of your day, and thank you so much for joining us today.